there. So as, as much as we enjoy our uh, time of worship together uh, in singing and as much as we enjoy, enjoy each other's company and connecting together, I pray that your heart looks forward to and longs for the time that we spend together in worshiping God's word this morning. I pray that you're hungry for God's word, for his truth this morning, because he wants to feed your soul, amen? Uh, so will you take uh, some time with me this morning to, to look to our God together? And I recognize that, that as much as I can prepare or feel unprepared at times, uh, as much as I can plan uh, and put things together and, and, and think through and process God's word in my own mind sometimes during the week, that I am utterly incapable of producing any level of change and transformation in your heart and in my own heart apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. So we want to stop and ask, ask the, the Holy Spirit to speak to speak to us this morning through his word. Because all of us are coming from different places, right? We're in different positions in life. All of us have had different kinds of weeks. Some of us are dealing with children. Some of us are dealing with stressful careers. Uh, some of us are dealing with relationship issues. Uh, some of us are dealing with financial challenges. We're all coming from different places. But the word of God has something to say for each of us in all of those situations. And so we come to him this morning to ask him to speak to us and to reveal uh, his heart to us through his word. Uh, so would you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Father, we are grateful, Lord, that you have not called us uh, to a religion but that you've called us into a relationship with a living Christ. And it is to you that we come this morning, Lord. It is to you, as we've already sung about, Lord, that we find life. It is in you, God, that we find hope, Lord. It is in you that we find light and peace and, and all that you are that you long to give us. And so to you we come this morning and we ask, Lord, we ask humbly that you would speak to each one of us, God. I pray I pray for each person here, for every, every person that you've brought here by your divine providence that you've placed in this sanctuary this morning, and even for those that are uh, watching on live stream this morning. And I pray for each and every heart, Lord, uh, for an opening uh, of hearts. I pray for an opening where they have been capped or protected by walls, uh, that, that you would remove those walls this morning, Lord, that you would take off the cap, and that we would expose ourselves to your truth this morning, to your word, to what you want to say to us and how you want to transform our lives. And we recognize that in, in all, of, all things, Lord, uh, that you are the answer. We thank you for the gospel, as we've been talking so much always about the reality of the gospel, the power of God and their salvation for those who believe. And so we thank you for that power in our lives, Lord, power to overcome sin and darkness, power to overcome strongholds, uh, power to overcome shame, power to overcome addictions. Uh, Lord, we thank you for that power to overcome anxiety. Thank you for the power of the gospel and that you've imparted life to us. And so we ask, Lord, that the life of God would be, would be stirred in us this morning, Lord, as we come to your word. I'm so dependent on you. Holy Spirit, fill me this morning. Lord, I'm your servant. And I pray that you would speak through me, Lord, your life in your way. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, as we've been going through Romans together... Um, if you, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn to, uh, to Romans uh, chapter 1. Romans, that's toward, toward the beginning of the New Testament. And last week we talked about that we needed to hear 
the bad news in order for the good news to be good news, right? We needed to recognize the bad news of the reality of our, of our sin and the wrath of God on our sin in order for us to recognize and realize the good news of the gospel to save us from the wrath of God. And we talked last week about that wrath uh, having been revealed uh, by God, that God's, God revealed himself even apart from his word. And he, and he talks about in Romans 1 that we're all without excuse because God's revealed himself even in nature, right? It's impossible for us to see the reality of the cosmos and not realize that there's a creator. It's an illogical conclusion. And God has also revealed himself to us in our conscience that he has hardwired us to know that there is a God because there is a right and wrong. And we know that uh, within us and there's no other way, there's no other explanation for any kind of a standard of right and wrong unless there is an ultimate determiner of that right and wrong. And so we know that that's been hardwired within us uh, that there is a God who exists. But the good news in all of that is that God himself clothes himself in flesh in the incarnation and he steps out of his throne from heaven into earth in the form of a baby, right? And grows up as a man and is crucified for the sins of mankind so that he himself, the one who has said that there's wrath for those that, 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 don't, that don't believe, he is the very one who would step down and take the wrath of God upon himself by shedding his blood so that through believing this message of the gospel that we can be relieved of the wrath of God and invited into the family of God. And that is really good news. Amen? And so Paul continues his letter to make it clear that apart from Christ that we're all subject to the wrath of God. Both the irreligious and the religious right? Both the immoral and the moral. Um, is there anybody in here who likes to travel? You like to fly? Like a lot of frequent flyers? Um, hmm. Maybe like a third? Um, I, I love to travel. My wife is not as big of a fan of, of traveling as, as I am. Um, one of the things that I hate, though, is airports, like, does anybody actually like, like airports? It's the, it's the worst, right? All the checkpoints and the luggage and just the waiting. And then when you get on the plane, like this is the worst. When you get on the plane, there's that little kind of eerie quietness, right? People are just kind of quiet. And you get in your, you find your seat, right? If you, uh, unless you're flying certain airlines, you have assigned seats. Uh, and you get in and you find your seat, you put your luggage where it's supposed to be, and it's just that's stressful. And then it feels like you're in like this compartment, right? And there's, it feels like there's no air. And you finally get your seat and you sit down there and you're, you're kind of feeling that tension, right? Where you're, you're trying to relax. But then the flight attendant comes up, right? And then she does her demonstration. Right? If you've flown at all, you know what I'm talking about, right? That if, if, uh, you know, if the pressure drops in the cabin, the, the mask is going to drop from the, from the ceiling, right? And you take the mask and you put it on like this, right? And, you're, and your seat is a flotation device, right, if we crash into the ocean. And <laughs> but, but if you've flown more than three or four or five times, What's probably happened is that you've begun to tune out the flight attendant because you're like, I know this message and I don't really need it, right? Because the chances of that happen is like almost nothing. And if, I, if we do crash, I'm not going to remember any of that anyway because I'm being like such a panic, right? <laughs> but, but that's what happens is we like tune out the flight attendant because we think that the message that we're receiving from them is not really one that we need to hear. And so often as we read throughout the Old Testament, we see all of this talk about idolatry. And you read the first two commandments, right? Uh, does anybody know? Who, what's the first commandment? Good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? And what's the second commandment? So the second commandment of the ten Right? You shall have no other gods before you, right? So now Jesus made this one commandment, right? You love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So you're right, brother. But the, the first two of, this, of the Decalogue of these Ten Commandments, right? Love the, love the Lord and that you shall have no other gods before you, that you should not make for yourself a graven image, um, 
it's amazing that this we see uh, that, that there's over a thousand references to idolatry in the Bible as you read through Scripture. But we tend to skip over them as though this was a problem for Old Testament people, just for the, old, the, the Israelites in the Old Testament. But when we journey through the Old Testament together, as we do in uh, Old Testament 1 and 2 and equip, shameless plug, um, so we see that the, the Israelites were continuously idolatrous people. We sang, uh, do it again. I've seen you move, right? You move the mountains, and you can do it again. They saw it, right? They saw God part the Red Sea, part the Jordan. They saw him do miracles, set them free, right, from the captives of, uh, of, of Egypt. God saw them sustain them with, with manna from heaven, like God revealed himself in amazing, incredible ways. And yet what we find that, at, that as they have entered into the promised land that God promises them 400 years earlier and they're finally in this inheritance as God is blessing them, Joshua says to them, choose this day who you'll serve, right? Either you're going to serve, if you think Baal is God, then serve Baal with all of your heart. But if Yahweh is God, then serve him. But what we find is that over and over and over that they chose idolatry. They chose to worship other gods regardless of the fact that God kept revealing himself to them as Yahweh. But what we see, what we find in this is not a message for people who lived thousands of years ago, but a message for people who live today because it reveals to us that the condition of the human heart Right? It reveals to us our tendency and our propensity to wander from who God is and that our hearts at the core are idolatrous. Um, there's a guy named Kyle Eidelman somebody that, uh, he, he wrote a book called, what was the book he wrote, Matt? God's at War. So he wrote a book about idolatry. And I think it's really ironic that the guy's name is Eidelman and he wrote a book about idolatry. Just... <laughs> It's kind of funny. Um, but this is what he says. It is profound. He says, behind every sin in your life and my life is an idol that is winning the war to sit on the throne of our hearts. That's what lies behind every sin in our lives, right, is an idol that's, that is striving to sit on the throne uh, of our hearts. I think I have that quote right there in the presentation, um, if you want to put that up there. Um, so really what's happening in this portion of Paul's letter to the Romans, this is really what he's going to address. This is what he's going to zero in on. Uh, so look with me at uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 22, or I say picking up kind of where we left off last week. And it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images representing mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And I, I want to share with you this morning that you are, as, as this passage speaks about worship, I want to share with each and every one of you this morning that you are created to worship. And now you might think, well, I, I don't really know how to sing. I don't know how to play an instrument. Be we have reduced, it, at least in our culture, I think that we've reduced the idea of worship to some songs that we sing on Sunday morning. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. That's not, that is a, a, a very small part of worship. What is worship? Right? The definition of worship is worship. It's, it's worth what we value above everything else. That's what worship is. What do you in your life value? What do you ascribe worth to above everything else in your life? And whatever that thing is, that's what we give ourselves to. That's what worship is. And Paul addresses this later on. We're not going to get to this for many weeks uh, in, in uh, chapter 12. And, and he says that, that I'm urging you, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable before God. And he says that that is your spiritual act of what? Worship. He says it's not singing songs on Sunday morning. It's not playing the guitar, although that's awesome. 
He says, but this is worship, is presenting your bodies. And I really, and I always think that this is so interesting. He doesn't say present your soul. He says present your body. Like present all of you. Present your thoughts, your actions, your words, your motives. He says that's worship when you present that to God. Now listen, we worship that which we give ourselves to. We give ourselves to that which we believe will satisfy that's what we give ourselves to, right? Whatever it is that we believe that has ultimate worth and value in our lives, that's what we believe will ultimately satisfy and fulfill us, and so that's what we worship. That's what we give ourselves to because we believe that it's that which has the greatest reward in our lives. So do you realize this morning, not just you guys here that are like people who come to church, but that everyone, everyone worships something. Right? You are a worshiper. No matter where you're at spiritually, you are a worshiper. And what happens when people refuse to acknowledge God and depend on God as God? Listen, I want you to hear this this morning. This is what happens when people refuse to acknowledge God as God and they refuse to depend on God as God. That we do not simply stop worshiping. So you might think, well, if someone refuses to acknowledge God, that they're not worshiping. But that's not what happens. We do not stop worshiping. We simply change the object of our worship because you are hardwired to worship. And so we look to other gods intrinsically. We look to other gods like money and and, and position and status and beauty because we think that in those things that we worship, that we give ourselves to because we value those things, over everything else. And so we think by giving ourselves over to those things that they will, they will satisfy, that they will complete us, that they're going to bring us security and peace and significance, right? And so we give ourselves, we make them gods in our lives. And, you know, I, I think it's like, uh, it's, it's like chasing shadows. And if we went out into the parking lot and you saw a really nice car out there, let's say it was your car that was really nice. And that car casts a shadow into the parking lot. And you look at that shadow and you say, oh, that is really nice. Boy, I would really like to have that. And, and the car drives and you're chasing the shadow, right? Oh, that is so cool. I really like that. I really want to have that, right? What we're doing is we're just chasing a shadow of what we really could actually have. And all of these things in life, whether it's money, position, prestige, um, Whatever it is in life that God wants to offer us, in, in him, he, like, he offers us significance and he offers us peace and he offers us security. But what happens is we're chasing the shadow of these things throughout life, trying to grab hold of these things. And what, what happens? We never land, right? We never become home. We never, we never hold on to it. We never obtain it because they're only shadows. The shadow that God has casted for us in all of these things that can only be found in him. Now, I want you to consider this morning the reality of how you have been created as a worshiper. And we we reflect the the image of God. That's how we were created, right? So how is mankind was created, right? Go back to, to Genesis 127, that God made man and women in his image. In his likeness. That is how he created us. He fashioned us in his likeness. And what what that means is that you have intellect just like God does. That you have volition, like you have a will just like God does. That you have emotion just like God does. He created us in his image. That's why we're different than animals, right? We're totally different than animals, right? Animals don't reason. Animals don't make decisions, right? They don't have emotions and relationships because we are created in the image of God, right? Only us. And just like a mirror, you, I believe, you guys, that, that your life is like a mirror, that all of us are like a mirror, and that whatever we are gazing at in life is what we reflect. So in other words, if you were to hold a mirror up, that mirror isn't the same. It's not, it's not the same, same image no matter where it's at. It's when I, wherever I hold it up, that's what it's reflecting, right? Whatever that mirror is gazing on is what it is reflecting always. Now listen, we always image what we worship. So track with me here. We always image what we worship. Like we reflect whatever is our God. So it's a law of nature. 
This isn't, for, this isn't just for Christians. This is for everybody. We always reflect what we worship. In other words, you will reflect what your God produces. You always reflect what your God produces. So in other words, like if your God is money, this is what you're going to reflect. You're going to reflect greed, right? If your God is money, you're going to reflect greed. You're going to reflect materialism. You're going to re reflect pride and anxiety if your God is money. Does that make sense? Hopefully. What are you going to do, right? Um, <laughs> what are you going to do? Say no? It doesn't make sense? <laughs> Hang on with me. Hopefully, if it doesn't, it will soon. Like if your God is pleasure... What, what do you reflect? You, begin, you reflect laziness. You reflect selfishness. You reflect a lack of self-control. If your God is success, well, you reflect pride and, and control and manipulation. If your God is beauty, you, have set, you reflect self-absorption and, and shallowness. We reflect whatever it is that we worship. But listen, if Jesus is your God, you reflect his nature. So you reflect freedom. Right? If Jesus is your God, right, that's what you're going to reflect in your life is freedom and joy and peace. Right? If Jesus is your God, you're going to reflect righteousness. You're going to reflect his character. Amen? Right? That's not religion. People, that's just reality. Whatever we worship, we reflect. And so what happens when people refuse to acknowledge and depend on God as God? We do not stop worshiping. We don't just stop worshiping. We simply change the object of our worship. And so if you choose not to worship God, you will worship a God substitute. You always, again, you're always going to worship something. So if you choose not to worship God as God, you are going to choose to worship a God substitute. That you're naturally going to place something into your life that will fill the space that only God can fill. Something that ultimately what's going to happen when you do that is whatever, whatever our God is, it always rules over us. It always exercises control over us because this is how God created us. And so, um, so he says here in, uh, in verse uh, 26, so for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passion. Now, this is going to get crazy, you guys. It's going to get ugly, so I'm just warning you. All right, so look. He says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were considered, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. So it's interesting that in this text this morning, that Paul uses this phrase three times that he says that God gave them up to. Like that God released them over to things. He says that God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity. That God gave them up to their dishonorable passions. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So listen, what is it that God is giving people up to? What he's giving people up to is the other gods that they worship, right? You tracking with me? That's what God is giving. Okay, if Baal is God, then, then serve him, right? If money is God, then serve it, right? Whatever is your God, God, God say, okay, if that's going to be your God, then serve that. Then, then I'm going to give you over to that. So how does God judge godlessness and, and wickedness? This is how he does it. He's by, by giving us what we want. So this is what he says. He gave them up to the lust, to the passions, to unnatural desires. So sometimes God, God's judgment in our lives, in people's lives, looks like him giving us what we, what we say we want. Right? That's the reality of what happens, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so when I was a kid, um, I spent a lot of time uh, with my, with my great-grandmother. Um, her name was Grandma Mabel. She just sounds so sweet, doesn't it? Right? And she was. She was like the sweetest woman on earth. She was like five foot tall. Um, to, to know her was to love her. Grandma Mabel, she was, she was the best. And so I used to spend time at her house. I would sleep over. And, um, and when I got a little bit bigger, I started cutting her lawn. Like I, I know I'm one of those weird people that likes to do yard work, and I have always since I was a kid. So I, I would cut her grass for her. And she had her car uh, parked. Uh, on the side of her yard, and um, the car had to be moved so we could get, get to the rest of, rest of the grass. Now, let me just tell you, Grandma Mabel, she had the ugliest car you've ever seen in your life. 
Does anybody know what an AMC Pacer looks like? Okay. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Okay, you're all you're all gasping already, but you don't understand. This pacer was like it was like seafoam green. It was literally the ugliest, and it was so funny because she had this car for so many years. And I remember when I turned 17, she said she was going to give me this car for me to drive, and I was like, <laughs> oh, I think I would rather walk than drive that. Anyway, so so Grandma Mabel, I had to move her car, or she had to move her car, maybe like 10 feet. And I said, I said, Grandma, I can do it. Now, I was like, I think I was like Sayla's age. I was like 10 years old or something. Maybe I was a little older. Um, but I said, Grandma, I can, I can do it. And she was like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm like, no, I can do it. I know how. I mean, I was only just moving it up a little bit. I know how to do it. She's like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm like, and I persisted. She's like, do you, you know how to do this? And I'm like, yeah, I got it. In my little mind, I had seen you know, my parents do this over and over and over, right? How many times have we gotten in a car and drive? So I'm like, I got this, right? So I hop in, and I, all I needed to do was just move it up straight, like 10 feet, right? And I got in the car, and I went to put that thing in drive, and boom, like I hit reverse, like I start going backwards, and Grandma Mabel like jumps in the car. She's like 85 years old. No, I'm not kidding. So she like jumps in the car and puts it in park, and, and she pulls me out of the car, and she's so sweet. She never said a word. Like, she didn't say a word to me. She didn't say, what are you doing? But in, you know, in my mind, I, I, I didn't realize that you need to put your foot on the brake before you put it in gear. So lesson learned. So if Sayla said to me at 10 years old, Dad, I want to take the car out. Dad, I want to take, no, that's not a good idea. Dad, I want to take the car out. No, you're going to hurt yourself if you do that. Dad, I want to take the car out. I can do it. This is what I want. But listen, you're going to hurt other people. Dad, I want to take the car out. And if I said, if I threw her the keys to my car and I said, here you go, and she got in the car and somehow she backed out of the driveway and she smashed into the neighbor's car, right? And then she drove into the other neighbor's house and she's wrecking everything and she gets hurt. What's happened? I, g I gave her what she wants. Right? What she wants is destructive to her. What she wants is destructive to other people around her. But sometimes we want what we want, and when we get what we want in life, often it hurts us, and it hurts other people, and it hurts and destroys our culture, and that's really what Paul is describing here. If I gave you what you wanted, and what you wanted brought judgment on you for your choice. So in other words, like, if you make riches your God, you're going to be destroyed by your own greed. Right? Okay, that's what you want, right? You want wealth? Okay, here you go. Right? If you make sex your God, you're going to be destroyed by your own perversion. And so he says that he gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart. And this is what ultimately destroys people is getting what we want. Listen, the things that we serve other than God will not free us. Instead, they will control us. Right? The things that we serve other than God, they won't free us. That's what we think, they, but they won't free us. They instead will control us. And since our hearts were made to serve God, who is our provider and our satisfier, when we serve the created, we always feel like we need more. Right? We need something else because it's utterly insufficient to satisfy the real desires of our hearts. Now, remember, when God created mankind, what did he do? He made a pronouncement. When he created all things, he made a pronouncement, and he said, it is good, right? The, and, and so God, in, in, in our lives, he gives us lots of good things, and the problem is that when we make good things into God things. So, in other words, like he created things like food and work and sex, but when we rely on these things as a means to satisfy the deepest desires of our hearts, we have made these good things into God things. Because this is something that only God can do, that he's, only, he's the only one that is able to satisfy those deep desires of our hearts. And so it says that he gave them up to the lust in their hearts. And a few weeks ago, uh, in, a, in a different uh, sermon uh, series five or six weeks ago, uh, I talked about th this word uh, appeared in the text, the, the word lust. And this is what that actually means. It's, it's the Greek word epithumia. And what it means is over-desire. 
So it doesn't, in the reality uh, is our desires are often not bad, right? Because we want, we want the things that God wants for us, right? We want to have significance. We want to have security. We want to have peace, right? Those aren't bad desires. But what happens is when epithumia, right, the, that our heart lusts for these things above anything else. And so what happens? We make them our God. We over-desire those things. So the problem of the human heart is not so much the desire for bad things, but the over-desire for good things. I hope that makes sense. It's our turning of good things into God things. And, and so when, when you make these things your God, let, let's say, for example, like intimacy, right? We're hardwired to need intimacy. That's a good thing. It's a good desire. Right? We want intimacy. And we want intimate relationships, but let's say you, you don't get it from the relationship that you're in, like your marriage, and so you go outside of that looking for it in another relationship, right? It's an over-desire. That's what a lust is. It's an over-desire, right? Uh, you know, let's say you, you want significance, and so you spend your life, if that, is, that, that becomes your God, you spend your life in constant comparison and a need to succeed and to be better than the next person, and what happens? It destroys you, Right? Because you've made a good thing a God thing. You know, security. Security is good, right? We want security. But when we make that a God thing, when making money becomes the highest priority, uh, you f end up forfeiting your family and, and, uh, and, and you become a different person. It's destructive. And so the worst thing that can happen to us is to be given what our hearts over desire. And, and this is how God's judgment comes. To us, you know, for example, for uh, for a man who worships success, the worst thing that could happen to that man is to be given the job promotion. Right? That's the worst thing that could happen to them. You see, when people reject who God is, and they reject God's plan, the gospel, God gives them what they want. Listen to me. When people reject God's plan for their lives, and when they reject the gospel, they they're given what they want a world without God, right? Isn't that what so many people in our culture want? And that's what they're pushing for is a world without God. Now, and I want you to listen to this quote by C.S. Lewis from The Great Divorce. That was one of the hardest books, um, hard, his hardest books to read. But there's something really insightful here that I want to share with you. He says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those, to who, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. You get it? So there's only two kinds of people. Either you're going to say, thy will be done, or God is going to say to you, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Because what we're saying by disregarding God as God is we're saying, I want another God. I want a life without God. I want a life without that God. And so ultimately, that's what God ends up giving us. And so as we continue in... Uh, in the text, as we read uh, those two verses, um, let me just hit, hit this again. Uh, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for that that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and are consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their heir. Now, the elephant in the room of this text is the reference to homosexuality. Now, this has become such a huge topic in our culture. It's, it's become so influential in our culture. And, and, and I want you to look at the text, the truth of, of God's word this morning. The word that he uses here is unnatural relations, right? It literally means against nature. So he's saying that this is a violation of the, of the created order that God gave us. It's contrary to his order. And I don't think one needs to be a biblical scholar to see that. Now, in, and if you try to interpret this a different way, you have to do some serious acrobatics with the text to try to reinterpret this to say that somehow God supports this idea uh, of homosexuality. And I know that I'm going to be canceled for saying this, Right? Thank God we only get maybe 50 views on our uh, YouTube on, on each sermon each week. Uh, this one will probably get like 1,000, and then I'll get, I'll get canceled. But that's okay. Because it's God's truth. Right? Like, don't shoot the messenger. It's God's truth. So 1 Corinthians uh, 6 says, or Do you not know that the unrighteous will not, listen, 
the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now look, real quick, this passage tells us at least three things. As a real quick look at this. Number one is that those who live lives of disregarding God's law will not inherit God's kingdom. Right? Do you hear that? Those who live lives disregarding God's law will not inherit God's kingdom. Right? You can't have both. It just doesn't work that way. The second clear thing that we see in this text is that homosexuality is among those practices that keep people from inheriting the kingdom of God. Again, I'm going to be canceled. Right? But this is God's truth. Right? We can't live lives that are contrary to God's truth and expect to receive God's kingdom. But listen, he also says that, that the, the reality is, he says that such were some of you. So the third thing that we see clearly in this text is that these were descriptions of non-believers who didn't know Christ. He says that, that yeah, you guys, some of you guys practice that, but now he says that you've been washed, that you've been saved. It is not possible for one to live in a blatant disobedience to the commands of God's kingdom and still inherit. And so, you know, one of the things, and it's amazing how often as, as I'm sharing, I, I was sharing the gospel with a guy, um, I met with this guy in my business networking group a, a few weeks ago, and I had a really neat opportunity to sit and to share uh, the gospel with him, and he was really receptive. We had a great conversation, and uh, it's, it's so funny because he, he raised this question. It doesn't even, he's, he's not homosexual, but for some reason he raised this question. But what about, it's so interesting to me that so many people are, are concerned about this question. And so one of the things that comes up is, well, what about people who are, are, are born that way? Aren't people, uh, some people are just born that way, right? Well, what, what does that mean? Well, that, that means that people are, some people are just like naturally attracted to members of the same sex. But listen, follow, follow my, my train of thought here that people are attracted to all kinds of things, right? People are naturally attracted to all kinds of things, and it doesn't make it right, right? If I am attracted to another woman, right, that's not right, right? I, I can't just say, well, I'm attracted to them, so that's how God made me, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave my wife and live with, with this woman, right? And just, I just want you to play out the dangers of this logic, right? Be, and, and I know this is going to sound really terrible, but again, I, I just want you to play this out and see how it's rolling out in our culture. And that we say, okay, well, there are people, and now, th like 10 years ago, you think I was totally making this up, but there's people who are attracted to children. Now, don't, I'm not comparing homosexuals to pedophiles, but listen, hear, hear my logic. That there's people who are attracted to children. And so years ago, we called them pedophiles, right? And we said, this is wrong. And there's laws against this, and you can't do that. I know that's what you naturally, your natural propensity is, but it's clearly wrong. And so you need to find another path of life. But what's happened now is that we have laws in certain states that protect people who are attracted to children so that they can have sex with children. And I wish I was making this up. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing. But this is, this is the kind of thing that Paul is describing in the text, right? That God gives you over to the, to the lusts and the passions and the things that you think you want. And ultimately, this is how the wrath of God is revealed, that you're getting as a culture that we're getting what we want, right? And this is the kind of thing that's destroying our culture. So we play out this logic, okay, well, I, I want what's, what I want, and this is how I was made. And even though God says no... This is the road, that the dangerous road that we go down. And so in verse 32, he says that though they, they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Now, I'm not just talking about that. Hang on there with me. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And so what has happened in our culture is all of this sexual perversion Right? And the idea of the LGBTQ and that you can now define your own gender and you can allow your children to define your own gender. I mean, it all defies logic, first of all. Right? Well, I don't even have to, to argue that biblically. But the reality is that this is the kind of perversion that happens when we compromise. Because, because what's happened is years ago, you said, well, you know, homosexuality is not really accepted. But now the church has begun to accept it 
the church has begun and pastors marrying homosexual couples and and allowing homosexual pastors and so what's happened is this this compromise 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 and and so it, it what what happens is it becomes more and more perverted and it becomes normalized and that's the agenda of the culture so this whole agenda of, the, of LGBT and all that is to normalize so that you and your children will think that not only is this tolerable and not only is it acceptable, but it's preferable. And you should explore it yourself. Do you hear? Guys, we are being lied to every day. Our children are being lied to all the time. Disney is lying to our children. Disney I think Walt Disney would turn over in his grave if he heard what was happening now in these Disney movies that have an agenda to try to get your children to think that maybe they're not even the right, the right gender. It's mind-blowing. But this is the kind of perversion that happens when we allow this, when we accept it, and it becomes normalized, and now there's an agenda. And that's the world in which we live. But listen, how do we respond to this? Right? That's the question. As the church of God, as a people of God, how do we respond to this? There's three options. We can take a legalistic approach. Right? We can shun them. We can say they are undeserving of Jesus. That's one approach that Christians take. Right? Or we could take a liberal approach and we could say, well, as a church, we need to be relevant. I, I just heard a, I don't know, actually, I, I just heard a, a pastor, like very well known, uh, big time pastor, and he was just talking about this. I was just in shock that, uh, that, that, that their approach and that he was talking about a man who was with another man and the reason they wouldn't let him serve in the church was because he wasn't divorced from his wife yet not because he was with a homosexual I was like wow like really that's how we've gone like that's how we're, we're rationalizing this so we can take a liberal approach and say that we need to be relevant right and we don't even talk about it we don't want to make anyone feel comfortable right we just need to love people where they're at so those are two polar opposite approaches that we could take but the right approach, I believe, is the gospel approach. That we need to take a gospel approach with people who are embracing this lifestyle, with people who are believing this. Because it's clear that these acts are sinful. But listen, but it is among a list of other sins, like envy and gossip that, that come a little closer to home for a lot of us, right? But God's grace and forgiveness can reach into that just as much as it can reach into my pride and, and, and your gossip, right? That God's grace is just as effective for that as it is for those things in our lives. So that's the approach that we need to take. Yeah, this isn't right, but Jesus wants to save you, right? Jesus wants to restore and give you life. And so in this text, it says, those who practice such things deserve to die. Look at Look, I'd, I'd want you to look at this list again. I want you to hear this if you're listening this morning. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Are you on the list? Because I am, right? If we're honest, I'm on the list, and I think you're on the list. And you know what? You know what the, the reality of the gospel says? That all this is sin, and the wages of sin, what is earned by this, is death. And that's what Paul reminds us here. He says it's worthy of death, that all of us are worthy of death, because that's what we've earned, because we have all disregarded who God is. But the good news is that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That is the good news of the gospel. And so now Paul has been addressing, he's been addressing the unrighteous, and he's been addressing the immoral. But now the tables are going to turn. So a reference, office reference for those office fans there. Now listen. So hang in there with me a few more minutes. So if you've been listening to this, right, and you're really spiritual and you're really religious and you're like, yeah, give it to them. Yeah, those, those wicked sinners. Listen. Listen to what Paul has to say to you. He says, therefore, they have no excuse 
You have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. But do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up for yourself the wrath of God on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So, so the Jews, the religious people that are reading Paul's letter, right now they're thinking like, go get him, Paul. Right? They would have been agreeing with him so far about the, God's wrath on, on the unrighteous people, right, on the unspiritual people. But as soon as Paul gets to, to this section, a, as those people are saying, I'm glad I'm not like them, Shoo. Paul basically says, you are like them when you're judging them. And, and so for those that Paul address, addresses again, he's addressing not only the unrighteous, but he's addressing the self-righteous because he says both are lost. And so he says that we who judge practice the very same evil. Do you hear that? Like he doesn't make a distinction. He doesn't say, well, there's a pass for you. He says that you're practicing the same evil as they are. So Paul, listen, Paul is not telling us to turn a blind eye to somebody's behavior and have the attitude that there are different standards for different people, that there's different right and wrong for different people, right? It's subjective. That's not what he's saying. Paul is not instructing them not to judge whether a behavior is right or wrong. Listen, listen to me. This is a really important distinction. That Paul is not instructing them not to judge whether a behavior is right or wrong. But what he is addressing is the one who judges that behavior and says, I'm glad I'm not like that. That I'm more righteous than that person. That's what Paul is speaking to here. And some of you may remember there's a parable that Jesus tells. And he tells about two people that are standing before the temple and offering worship to God. And the one uh, is, a, is a, a Pharisee, and the other is a tax collector. Like, he's a really, like a really bad sinner. And, and, the, and the Pharisee says, the, the, the tax collector says that he beats his breast, and he says, woe is me. Right? He says that, I, that I'm sinful. He says, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. And then the Pharisee standing next to him looks at him, and he says, boy, I'm glad I'm not like that guy, right? Because I got it together, and I pray, and I fast, and I give, right? And then Jesus says, which one of those men went away justified? Right? It was the man who said, have mercy on me, a sinner. John Stott says this, that we work ourselves up into a state of self-righteous indignation over the disgraceful behavior of other people, while the very same behavior seems not nearly so serious when it's ours rather than theirs. Isn't that true? Right? If we're honest, right, it's so easy for us to judge other people. It's like having bad breath. It is so easy to spot on other people, right? but we can't see it often in our own lives. You know, and and it, for us, it's like you may look at someone who who has a drinking problem, who's an alcoholic, and they, and you know they, they they get drunk, and then they beat their wife, and they do terrible things, and and we say, how could they live like that? Instead of recognizing the sin that's destroying that person's life, and that they need the grace of God. And if I condemn them in my heart, I myself am condemned for my own pride and my self righteousness, right? For that heart posture. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, who was a um, uh, theologian and um, uh, philosopher, uh, uh, modern day, I think he was, he was born in like the early 1900s, uh, he says something really, uh, really profound. Um, do you guys know, anybody know what a tape recorder is? <laughs> it's the challenge of having a young crowd, right? Um, so he says that we all have a tape recorder hanging around our neck. It records the things that we say to others and about others about how they are to live. On the last day, God will remove the tape recorder from our neck and will say, I will be completely fair. I will simply play this tape and judge you on the basis of what your own words are saying are the standard for human behavior. Wow. See, we don't even live up to our own standards. 
We can't live up to our own standards that we have for other people and the standards that we even have for ourselves. So what hope do we have? So he says, do you suppose, oh man, you who judge, who, do, who practice these things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So Paul is laying out a case here again that is both the unreligious and the re religious who are both condemned. The self-righteous person acknowledges the, the existence of God but really has no need for him, right? Because that self-righteous person, he can, he can get, get to heaven on his own, right, by, by his works. And so he has as well said that I don't need God. And so it's just like the prodigal sons, which I don't have time to go into because I need to wrap this up, right? The story of those two sons, you can go and, and read it. And what happens is there, we, we look at the story of this, we say the prodigal son, right? The one who walked away, the one who did bad things, the one who squandered the father's money. But the reality is there's two sons that are prodigal. Because the other son, even though he stayed home, even though he served the father and did the right thing, what we find at the end of this story is that that older brother, he was outside of the house because he refused to come in and celebrate his brother's return. He refused to come in and celebrate the lost one who was found. And so he found himself in a place of self-righteousness, and he was separated from the father, where the younger brother actually repented. And so Paul is showing that religious people need the gospel just as much as the unreligious people. And I, I love how um, this verse 4, you know, he says that it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. Did you ever think about that? That's what leads us to repent. I love how the uh, New Living Translation phrases this. He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's God's kindness. Did you ever do something wrong to somebody? Right? You really wronged them? And, and yet, instead of retaliating to you, they're really kind to you, right? That's the worst, isn't it? Like, they're, they're just still so nice to you and forgiving of you, and they're kind to you. What does it make you want to do? It makes you want to go to them and say, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I did this to you, right? It's their kindness that leads you to a place of apology. And it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance, and so what, what is repentance? Repentance literally means to change your mind. If you're dry, and I, I use this example all the time, but I think it's a really good one. If you're trying to drive to Ocean City and you're going, you're going north and you see the exit for Tom's River and you realize, oh, shoot, I'm going the wrong way. You don't keep driving that way, right? You're not going to get to your destination. What do you do? You say, you change your mind and you say, I need to get off this exit and I need to turn around. That's what repentance is. And this is a gift. God offers us the gift of repentance. You realize that, that he has given us his righteous standard, his law. None, all of us fall short of it, right? And he could condemn us all, but instead he allows us to repent. He gives us the gift of repentance, the offer of repentance. And so in 1 Peter uh, 3, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will for you, right? He doesn't want to condemn you, right? He doesn't want to see you come under his wrath. It is his will for you that you would all, that each of us would come to repentance. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and its works that are done on it will be exposed. And so... Paul is telling us here that there's two, there's two groups. We need to see this. There's two groups of people that Paul is addressing. He's addressing the unrighteous, the immoral, the irreligious. But he's also addressing the self-righteous, right? the moral, the religious people. And what he's trying to get to is that he's saying that both of those groups of people, wherever you find yourself on the spectrum, that both are trying to save themselves. One group is trying to save themselves by living really bad, right? By going out and, and doing what they want to do because they think that in that, that they're going to find meaning and significance and peace, right? That they're going to find the key to life by living really bad. And the other group is, 
trying to be their own God by living really good, right? And being very moral and doing all of the right things. But the reality is that both are lost in their sin and none are able to save themselves because only Jesus can save. And so again, the thesis of Paul's letter, as as we have reiterated these last few weeks, it rings true again as Paul makes this declaration that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. And you see, what the, what the gospel offers us is freedom from the wrath of God that he talks about. He says the wrath of God has been revealed, but listen, the righteousness of God has been revealed to us as well through Christ so that we don't have to be under the wrath of God, but we can be under the righteousness of God in Christ. And so he tells us later in this letter, in chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, he says that those who find themselves in Christ Jesus, those who, who repent and receive this gift of God in believing that Jesus died for our sins and that Jesus is the one who gives us life, he says that that one, that there's no condemnation for that one because they're under the righteousness of Christ. And so I would encourage you this morning, wherever you find yourself, if you, if you have not believed the gospel and you're not walking in that under the righteousness of Christ, and, and whether you're really like religious and really moral, but you don't really believe the gospel, or whether you're really irreligious and you're just living a life apart from God and, you're, and you're, your gods are the things of the world, this morning that for both groups of people, God offers repentance and that you repent and believe the gospel. And in doing so, what we receive is everything that we're chasing in all of those other areas, right? It's through the gospel that we receive the peace of God so that we can experience, we have the peace with God so we can experience the peace of God, right? That in that, we become sons and daughters of God, and so we have great significance and great purpose in life. So all that God wants to give us is found in the gospel. And so I pray that you would respond to the gospel this morning, wherever you're at. And so let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you, Lord, for, uh, for your word. And I thank you for this message that we could just we would preach it for, for eternity, the reality of the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And that it never gets old and it never gets irrelevant and it, it never gets used up and we never get over it. I thank you, Lord, that the gospel is not just the starting thing, but it's the main thing. I thank you that the gospel is not just a, a starting place, but it is the whole place. And so this morning, I pray for anyone here uh, who finds themselves on either side of, of these groups of people that are like super religious and moral, and trying to earn their own way, or they're super irreligious and immoral, and they're trying to save themselves in the ways of the world. I pray for, for both of those people uh, today, Lord, that they would come to a place of repentance, to change their minds about how they have been living, and to receive the gift that you offer them through repentance, to believe, Jesus, that you died for our sins, and that you rose again, and that you want to give us life, Lord. And so we thank you for that message today, in Jesus' name. So oh. 